All right, in the last video, we talked about how to make a basis. And so in this video, we're gonna talk about what can we do with a basis. I mean, it's really gonna be thinking about kind of our big skill for today is how can we visualize uh, coordinates in different systems? So what we're going to do is we're going to take what was our standard basis, um, which was, uh oh, well, some of these did not get transferred over to when I reformatted the notes, oh well, um, but hopefully you got the one online. Um, but our goal here today is to go from using our standard basis, which in R2, to remind you, the standard basis is the vector vectors 1, 0, 0, 1. And in R3, our standard basis is 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And instead of using these building blocks, kind of these as our units of measure, um, where we would think about in two dimensions, each unit being 1 times E1, which is the first entry, and 2 times E1. 1 times e2, 2 times e2. Do you see how each unit is using kind of a, is a coefficient of this vector and each unit up is a coefficient of this vector? We're going to ask ourselves today, how do we represent coordinates where we're using different building blocks? Where instead of saying this was 1e1, what if we're saying this is like 1b1 for a totally different basis? Um, how does that change our coordinates? What does that mean if we want to go from one system to another system? So our goal here, and I've highlighted it here, is to impose coordinate systems on vector spaces, meaning we would like to use a geometric coordinate system on vector spaces, even if they're not some kind of geometric uh, vector space already. So really, we're going to start thinking about um, the kind of the set of polynomials. That's the one I, we're going to keep going back to. Um, so the set of polynomials of at most degree n. So a couple things we want to go over before we start changing bases here. And that is, let me see if I can get it to refocus real quick. Okay, the fact that each coordinate is a unique representation of that coordinate. Um, so if we have a basis, and this is supposed to be b1, b2, all the way up to the n. So this is going to be c1, b1 here. Sorry that that didn't come out. Um, so if we have a basis for a vector space, okay, then for each x coordinate, okay, so some x vector in that vector space, there will be a unique set of scalars, c1, c2, c3, blah, 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 all the way up to cn, such that that vector x that we're looking for, kind of our goal, can be represented as a linear combination of the basis vectors. This is what we talked about last time. Having a basis means that we have a set of vectors that we can use as our building blocks to get to the entire vector space. So vectors like 1, 0, 0, 1, or something more complicated like 5, 6, 0, 7. Okay, as long as they're linearly independent and they span all of the space I'm looking for, all of that vector space or all of that subspace, then that counts as a basis. But the key is that this will be unique. Um, and you know that it's going to be unique because we talked about this last time, the vectors in the basis are linearly independent. So that means that uh, there is no, no way for me to over kind of bear, this is the most efficient set of vectors I could have used to create x. Um, and we know from our previous chapters that if a set of vectors are linearly independent, then if I put them in a matrix, there will be a pivot in every column. And if there's a pivot in every column, there will either be no solution, meaning I couldn't make that vector out of these vectors, and that would be something outside the vector space. Um, or there will be a unique way to make that x, okay? And that's because they're linearly independent. So in an equation form, we're really thinking about the equation ax equals b, but for since I changed up the variables a little bit here, I'm going to let a be the matrix that contains all of the basis vectors, b1 through bn, then c being the vector that contains all the coefficients, all the way up to cn, 
and x kind of being the coordinate of our, our answer, um, the one that we're looking for to be a linear combination of these basis vectors. Okay, we're saying that this vector c1 through cn is unique because the basis vectors are linearly independent. That is also what it means to be one to one. There will be a unique input, a unique set of scalars that creates this output, whatever I'm looking for. Okay, so we're going to focus on those C's. So focus on the weights. Okay, and we're going to call them their own vector. They're going to be the vector, I'm going to put this in brackets, the coordinate x with respect to the basis b. So I'm going to say that this, uh, this column, okay, this vector of, co of um, coefficients, that's going to be its own new vector. It's just going to be in the basis b. Okay, so remember how over here I was talking about how maybe the coordinate 2, 3 would be 2 times the vector 1, 0 plus 3 times the vector 0, 1, okay? So the coordinate was the coefficients of the basis vectors. That's what we're going to try to do here. This new coordinate is going to be the coefficients of the basis vectors. And this again was C1 and B1, okay? Um, but, uh, so again, sorry, got distracted there by C1 and B1. But so this is going to be our coefficients here. Okay, so we're going to use, okay, use the vectors, and this is our goal, in the basis as new units. So they're going to be the building blocks. The vectors in the basis are going to be the building blocks or the units for our geometric representation. Okay, they're going to be the units for the axes on the new coordinate system. And then if we use those vectors in the basis, so B1 through B dang it, B1 through Bn as our basis vectors, then that will say that the vector C1 through Cn, the vector we made out of the coefficients of the basis, will be a coordinate that we can plot. And that means that we can actually kind of think about transferring between the real, uh, like Rn, and the real systems that we've been working with, um, to a new system that might give us a new picture. So this example, we're going to try to visualize what this looks like. So we've got two basis vectors, b1, b2. b1 is the vector 3, 1, and b2 is the vector 0, 1. And then I'm going to let E1 and E2, that's our standard basis, okay, E1 is 1, 0, E2 is 0, 1. Okay, so we're going to try to express this vector, X sub B, in terms of the standard basis. So right now, we have been given the coordinates in the basis B. That means these are the coefficients of the basis uh, excuse me, of the two basis vectors b1 and b2. So if I'm thinking about, I have two kind of graph paper here. Here is my standard graph paper, um, my kind of r2 over here. This is my b graph paper, which means that each unit that I've graphed over here, and I've made it a little bit different just so we can tell them apart, is one vector in the basis. So I'm going to say that this is b1, one unit of b1. And this is two units of B1, and this is three units of B1, okay, using B1 as kind of my new kind of X direction almost. So this is one unit of B2, this is two units of B2, three, let's say four units of B2, five, six units of B2. So I'm using this vector as a unit of measurement going in one direction, and this vector as a unit of measurement going in the other direction. So the coordinate 2, 3 in, notice it says in basis B, is the coordinate 2 B1s and 3 B2s. So this right here is the x-coordinate 
with respect to the basis B, two, three. If I want to represent that though in the standard basis, I want to say, okay, these are the coefficients for each of the standard basis vectors. So you can think about it by either putting the two basis vectors in a matrix, three, one, one, zero, and multiplying by the coefficients. If I sketch that out a little bit, that's also me saying two times the vector three, one, again, we went two B1s to the right, plus three times the vector zero, one. Okay, and when I add those together, I get the vector six, five. And if I try to make the vector six, five, using coefficients in my standard basis. The coefficients I'm looking for are just, so the coefficients C1, C2 that I'm looking for are just C5. So that is X. That's our coordinate in the standard basis system. Okay, and that's why I plotted the point six, five. Okay, so you could either call this standard X, oops, sorry, or you could call this point X with respect to the standard basis E. It's just kind of like natural log though, we don't really write the E down here because it's in the standard basis. But notice I, I also put another graph down here and you can ignore this point now, let's just ignore that. And I can even use a different basis to create the same point. So let's make a new basis, let's call it basis, um, L for Laura because I'm selfish. Okay, um, so the basis for L, um, let's say I have to make two linearly independent vectors that will span R2. Um, I'm going to pick the vectors 6, 0 and 0, 5. Okay, those are linearly independent. There would be a pivot in each column and a pivot in every row. They span R2, so we're good. Okay, so that is my basis. If I want to graph the point 6, 5 using this basis, I'm asking myself, what are the coordinates of x with respect to basis L? Well, that will be the vectors, I guess we'll call them uh, alpha 1 and alpha 2, where alpha 1 times 6, 0 plus alpha 2 times 0, 5 will give me the vector 6, 5. Well, that's really easy. My x coordinate with respect to my basis L is just 1, 1. So if this is, I don't know what I call them, I guess I call this little L1, and this is 2 L1, this is 3 L1, again, using my, this is L1, and this is L2, okay, using my basis vectors as my units of measurement. Okay, so this is 1L2, and this is 3L2, and this is 5L2. Okay, me plotting this point 1, 1 is me going 1, 1. Okay, so this point here is the vector x with respect to the basis L. So you can see how as long as I have a basis, and I'm thinking about plotting the coordinate as thinking about what are the coefficients I would need to multiply the basis vectors by to get this point, okay? Using those coefficients as my coordinate helps me plot in any basis that I want. I could plot in the standard basis, I could plot in the basis B, I could plot in the basis L. Um, it helps me change in between. But again, our focus is on the coefficients that I would need to multiply the basis vectors by to get to my goal. Okay, so we can either do that with systems of equations or we can do that with matrices. So let's take a look on the next page at how to do that with a matrix. Okay, so using a matrix. I don't know why I put space here. Now, you'll notice if you looked at the field notes, there used to be a picture here. I deleted it for my notes because I thought it was relatively confusing. So I want to make sure that we're understanding how we get here. So to get a coordinate x in the standard basis, we multiply the change of coordinates matrix PB. And PB is just the matrix, just like I did before, made up of all of the vectors in the basis. Okay, Multiply PB 
by the coordinate x in the basis b. Again, because we're, and we're multiplying pv by this because these are the coefficients I would need to multiply each of the basis vectors by to get a linear combination. That was the vector I'm looking for, x. Okay, so we say that pb, if you want to think about it as a transformation, maps the coordinate x in terms of the basis to x in the standard basis. So this is in basis b, the system that uses basis b as its units, and this is the standard basis. Now, here's a note. If you want to go the other way, if I want to go from the standard basis to the basis b, I can just find the inverse of pb. Okay, and that should be, well, it depends. Okay, and I said that should be pretty easy because we're used to finding inverses, but remember that our basis here doesn't have to necessarily make a square matrix. We have to have linearly independent vectors, but a basis for a subspace doesn't have to span all of Rm, or, or excuse me, all of Rn. Nope, Rm. Rm is what I'm talking about. Um, so if I have a basis for a subspace, it may not be as easy to find the inverse as just plugging into our calculator um, or trying to use some of the formulas from chapter three, I think. Um, but we can always remember, think about all of this as a system of equations, a linear combination of vectors, and you could figure it out that way. So let's try an example. So again, I have two basis vectors, b1 and b2, and here they are, b1 is 3, 1, b2 is 0, 1, okay, so another same basis as before, and my x-coordinate in the standard basis is 6, 8. First thing is we want to find the change of coordinates matrix PB that goes from the basis B system to the standard basis in R2. That's relatively easy. PB is just the matrix 3, 1, 0, 1. Okay. Now, I then want to find the change of coordinates matrix PB inverse. Okay, so I want to go the other way. Well, this, uh, I know that these are linearly independent. And since it's square, that means I'm going to have a pivot in every row. So I am allowed to use my inverse formula, 2 by 2. So the determinant of PB is uh, 3 minus 0, so 3. So PB inverse is going to be 1 third, 1 of the determinant. We got some switching and some making negatives. Okay. So my PB inverse will be 1 third, negative 1 third, 0, and 1. Okay. And this matrix should map x onto some x sub b. So let's try it. Let's try it actually two ways. And this is not in the fill notes, so bonus, bonus. Okay. So if I am looking for x sub b, that means I am looking for what will be the coefficients, let's call them c1 of 3, 1, and c2 of 0, 1, that when I combine these two vectors together, I will get 6, 8. So visually, I think this one's easy to see. My vector, based on if I want to find it with a linear combination, x with respect to my basis b should be these coefficients, and it should be 2 and 6. Let's make sure I'm doing that right. <laughs> two, two, yeah, six, two, six. Okay, so we could do that by sight, but we could also use PB inverse. So if I want to find X sub B, I should also be able to multiply PB inverse times X, six, eight. Okay, so when I multiply those together, I am getting one third times six, which is two plus zero. And then one third time, or excuse me, negative one third times six, which is negative two plus eight. So I am in fact getting two six. So you can think about it as multiplying um, by an inverse, kind of undoing an operation, or you can think about it as what are the coefficients that go with this linear combination. As we do simple examples, this one might seem simpler, but you could see how if we if we had more vectors in the basis, we wanted to create a bigger coordinate, it might be easier to find the inverse of PB either using our calculator or kind of doing it by hand and then multiplying. Okay, so let's try the other way. OK, 
okay? We want to find the vector x determined by the given, co given coordinate vector. So here, I've been given the coordinate x in terms of the basis b, and then I was given the basis b. So if we're trying to find x, well, that really means I should just multiply pb, which is 4, 5, 6, 7, times the vector 8, negative 5 because these are the coefficients, and you can think about it this way as a matrix, or you can think about it being 8 times 4, 5, minus 5 times 6, 7. Either way, these are the coefficients of the basis vectors, and to find the coordinate in the standard basis, all I have to do is multiply them together. And that, the reason that's so easy, again, is because our building blocks for the standard basis are 1, 0, and 0, 1. So whatever coordinate I get out of here, the, that will also represent the coefficients I would need to multiply by 1, 0, and 0, 1 to get my coordinate in the standard basis. Okay, so if I'm multiplying, I'll do it the vector way. Why not? I am getting 32 and 40. I'll leave the negative on the outside. Minus... 30 and 35. So x, in terms of my standard basis, is 2, 5. Okay? All right, and there's one more example, but I'm going to skip that one so we can go on to kind of why are we doing this? What is this really useful for? Why would we do this if we're just going between R2 and R2? So here's the other example. I'm going to leave that blank for you to do on your own, and I know we're already kind of running long on time here. Um, okay, so the real goal of this is for us to be able to create a vector system for something that wouldn't normally look like it has vectors. And that's where we're going to use our polynomials. So this is a poly the standard basis for a polynomial of at most degree 2, not n, of at most degree 2 has three polynomials, p1, p2, and p3. And those polynomials are 1, t, and t squared. Okay. The polynomials in P2, since they have a standard basis of three elements, they're going to behave like vectors in R3. And that behavior is very specific. It's something we call where we make the two dimensions isomorphic. And we'll explain what that means below in a second. But we are going to create coordinates, vector, three dimensional vector coordinates out of the polynomials, P1, P2, P3, by using the coefficients, again, like we have been for the other ones looking at the coefficients of each of the elements in the standard basis that make up that polynomial. So the vector a, b, c would represent the coefficients a, which is multiplied by the standard basis vector, quote unquote vector, 1, b times the standard basis vector, t, and c times the standard basis vector, t squared. Okay, so for example, parallel worlds of R3 and P2. Our vector form, again, in R3 is the three coefficients. Vector form in P2 would just be us adding those three elements together. If we were to add two quote-unquote vectors or polynomials together in P2, that would look like us adding together these two vectors representing the two, or excuse me, or yeah, the two sets of coefficients for each of the polynomials. And notice that this helps us combine, this is actually direct combining like terms, because each row represents, each row represents the coefficients to a different, uh, a different vector in the standard basis. So the top row represents the, um, and it's not even just a constant, these would be a constant times one, represents the coefficients of the vector one, and I'm saying vector very loosely here. Again, these are vectors represented as polynomials. So the top row represents the coefficients of the vector or polynomial, P1, which is 1. Um, the second row represents the coefficients of T and the third of T squared. So what it means to have this kind of similarity is that we say that a vector space, V, so in this case, let's say, let's call that P2, it's isomorphic to another vector space, W, which in this case is R3, if every underline is vector space calculation. That's not every calculation. It's all of the calculations necessary to make up a vector space, okay, is accurately reproduced in the other vector space. So even though we technically could multiply two polynomials together and we can't multiply two vectors in R3 together, that doesn't mean they're not isomorphic because the only requirement to be isomorphic 
is that the vector space calculations are preserved. Um, so that means multiplying by a scalar, and that means uh, vector addition, um, the zero vector is present, all that jazz. Okay. Um, and the great thing about this is if I can prove that two, or if I know that two vector spaces are isomorphic, um, and I can prove, maybe it's easier to prove that something is linearly dependent or independent in the vector space R3, then I can automatically, if it is dependent or independent in R3, then the same thing will be happening in P2. So for example, it might be, and this is a really simple example, but it might be easier to determine whether or not, again, I'm going to keep filling in these stupid little blanks. That's what I get for printing something in Word and not in PDF form. Um, but if it's, again, a simple example, but if I want to determine if these three polynomials, so P1, P2, and P3, are linearly dependent or independent, I could do that visually by saying, okay, is any of these a linear combination of the other ones? Um, or is there some way that uh, they're, I can prove that they're all independent, they're not linear combinations? We can also do that easily by transferring the coordinates to the isomorphic system or an isomorphic basis and then check for independence. Okay, so I'm going to do this example and this question is down here is the same question so I'm going to skip that one but you can always check. So if I have all these polynomials are using the basis 1, t, and t squared. They're polynomials of at most degree 2. Okay, so then if I'm using my basis b, which would be the three dimensional vectors, okay, so basis b, 1, 0, 0, this is p sub n, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, okay, how can I represent p1, p2, and p3 going from p sub n basis to b? So the coordinates for P1 in terms of basis B are going to be the vector 1, negative 1, 0. Because there's 1 times 1, negative 1 times t, and 0 t squared. P2 sub B is going to be 2, negative 1, 1. Because I have two constants, negative 1 t and 1 t squared. And then P3 with respect to basis B is going to be uh, zero constants, two and three. Okay. So um, are these new vectors linearly independent? And we can test that by row reducing. Okay, when I row reduce, I get the identity matrix, and you can pause and do that in your calculator if you want. I just already have it written down. Okay, so our conclusion is, therefore, there is a pivot. Sorry, you can't see me write. I'm really bad at that. In every column, which proves that P1 in the basis B P2 in the basis B, and P3 in the basis B are linearly, linearly independent, which proves that P1, P2, and P3 are linearly independent. Okay, so again, transferring to a coordinate system that is isomorphic um, mean that all of the operations are upheld. Uh, all of the operations that are happening in one dimension will be mirrored and identical in the other dimension as long as they're operations for a vector space. Um, so me testing linearly ind linear independence with vectors meant that I was also testing linearly independence of polynomials. So I found that they were independent, therefore the polynomials are independent.
So go ahead and if you want to pause here, try this one. But I'm going to move on to the last example because we're already at 30 minutes. So last example. And if, gosh dang it, it didn't even, it didn't even save. Okay, this is supposed to be 9, so make sure you change that. So, coordinate vectors allow us to associate vector spaces with subspaces of other vector spaces. So, if I'm using a subspace, and again, B1 and B2, okay, I have a basis, B1 and B2, these vectors here, and I want the, uh, I want to make a kind of a subspace, H be the span of those two vectors, okay? I'm trying to find the coordinates or excuse me, the coordinates of this vector with respect to the basis B. Meaning, I'm trying to find the coefficients of these two vectors that would make, when I multiply them and then add them together, would make a linear combination to equal this. And again, I change this to 9, 13, 15. So in field notes, I did something very curious because I wasn't really thinking about it. There are two ways to think about this. And way one is to do what I just said. I'm trying to find coefficients c1 and c2 so that, oh, you can't see anything that I just wrote down, sorry, so that when I multiply c1 times the basis vector 3, 3, 1, and c2 times the basis vector 0, 1, 3, I will get 9, 13, 15. And you can see in the field notes, if you're checking them out, that I just went ahead and I made this into a system of equations using each row. So I said like c1, times 3 plus c2 times 0 equals 9. I guess I'll keep going and I'll write it the other way. 3c1 plus 1c2 equal 13 and c1 plus 3c2 equal 15. Okay, so I could solve it using a system of equations that way. Um, way 2 though is me thinking about this uh, being the kind of the PB. So I know that I could use the equation really, again, ax equals b, as if you weren't already tired of that, but x is kind of our goal, serving as our b, what we want it to be equal to. a is the matrix with the basis vectors, 3, 3, 1, 0, 1, 3, and I'm looking for, I guess I can fill this in, because I know what x is. 9, 13, 15. I'm looking for the vector x in terms of the basis b, that would multiply to give me this. Now, in the notes, I thought about the fact that I would need to multiply this matrix by the its own inverse on the left side. So I would have to do like 9, 13, 15 times p, b inverse has to be a left inverse, 3, 0, 3, 1, 1, 3. And I thought to myself, you know, it will be kind of hard to find p, b inverse, especially because it has to be a left inverse. It would mean that I would need to multiply the, ma the matrix 3, 0, 3, 1, 1, 3 by, and this is a 3 by 2 matrix, by another matrix to make it equal to the identity matrix, which has to be a square, which means that this has to be 2 by 2, which means that this would have to be a 2 by 3 matrix. And I was like, oh my gosh, this seems so hard. And to be fair, I don't know if you can do that in your calculator, I haven't tried myself, but what I just realized when I was going through these notes again to prepare for this is, I can just row reduce this. <laughs> this is the augmented part, this is the coefficient matrix part. So this should not be that hard to plug into your calculator as an augmented matrix. I don't know where my head was last year when I was preparing these notes. Okay, but you can just row reduce this and you can get an answer. now. Notice that I have two columns here. That means that my x sub b should only have two elements. Okay, it should not, uh, there should be maybe a row of zeros at the bottom when I get here. Okay, um, so it might be easier to think about it this way. And so now I'm, now I'm curious. I guess I would have to get a row of zeros here in order to say like, okay, x1 equals this, x2 equals this. And then, there, yeah, because then there wouldn't be an x3, it would just be x1 equals this, x2 equals this. So I am looking for a row of zeros here at the bottom. Okay, regardless of how you do it, whether you think about it as a system of equations, but we should get that x sub b is equal to the vector 3, 4. Okay, so our conclusion here is that the vector 
9, 13, 15 in the coordinate system R3 is associated, or even you could say like tied to, the vector 3, 4 in R2. So that means H, which is the span of the vectors B1 and B2, is isomorphic to R2. Okay? All right, so nobody think about it. But in conclusion, wrapping up this very long lesson, we learned about what can we do with a basis. And what we are doing with a basis is we are changing coordinate systems. We are using, instead of using the standard basis, we are using our new basis vectors as units of measurement and plotting coordinates in these new systems by looking at coefficients. What would the coefficients of these building blocks be? Um, and then plotting that coordinate. Okay, and it only works if we know what our goal is. If I want to represent this standard coordinate in a different system or vice versa. If I want to represent this coordinate in a basis in the standard basis. We have to have a goal kind of to make this all work out. But hopefully that shows you a little bit of the usefulness of basis um, and we are going to be doing a lot of change of basis. So if you have questions make sure that you ask, reach out, um, and make sure that you go and review how to find a basis also from 4.3. Have a great day!